Okay, so the next step. What we've done so far is we've basically just plotted curves and you can and should do that in your field notebook. I do it every night or every noon, Rafe, if you prefer. Um, you plot those curves and you basically look for when they are reaching an asymptote, when they're flattening off and they're not going up anymore, okay? But we really want to be a bit more quantitative than that. And so beginning in the 1980s, there was a series of efforts that were aimed at essentially taking that next step and going beyond just, just kind of qualitative um, evaluation. So a good friend of mine, Jorge Soberon, and a colleague in Mexico, Jorge Llorente, published this paper, which was kind of a landmark paper, the use of species accumulation functions for the prediction of species richness. And so essentially what they started exploring was what can you learn from the shape of that curve? And so this is an accumulation curve for butterflies in a, in a tropical forest in Peru. And you can see the dots are their totals by person hours. So if you put in 25 person hours, or maybe that's 20 personal hours, you get 110 species. If you put in another 20 person hours, you're up to 200 species. And you just keep spending more and more time. This is a different unit of effort. Okay, it could be individuals, it could be days, it could be trap nights, anything. But you put in more and more effort and you can see the numbers going up, okay? And here they're at 550 after having put in 200 person hours. Okay? So that's, that's the raw data that you all will be gathering in camp well, out of camp, but in Corrup National Park. Now, what Soberon and Jorente did was they said, well, that is a curve. So why don't we just fit some curves using nonlinear regression approaches? And so they did some, some explorations of, of conceptually what sorts of nonlinear regressions, nonlinear relationships should you be using? And they decided to explore a logarithmic relationship, an equation called Clench's equation, and an exponential relationship. And so they fit these curves, and you can see that in the interval where there are data, they have a pretty close fit. There's a little bit of deviation here where those points are not falling on the regression lines. Okay, but in general what you see is that all three of those lines do essentially the same thing between zero and 200 person hours. But then they allow their regression equations to extrapolate, which is to say this is the interval where they had data. And then they say, well, if we were to put in another 200 person hours, or another 400 person hours, what does that regression equation say about our data? And so the logarithmic equation keeps going up, and here at 400 hours, it's predicting another 700 species, uh, 700 species total. So that would be essentially the idea that a little bit less than 200 species remain to be found in that fauna if you double the amount of effort. Okay? But, for example, when they use the exponential equation, you see that curve kind of lays down faster. And so there, at 400 hours of work, it's only around 600 species. So essentially one of these estimators says that 200 species are left to discover in the fauna 
And one of these estimators says that only 100 species are left to be discovered in this fauna. I'll give you a different example. This is an accumulation curve for butterflies in western Pennsylvania. And essentially here, you can see the numbers of species are much lower. This is a temperate forest. This is kind of like where, where uh, the Kansas people live. It gets you know, some snow in the, in the winter, um, fairly cold, but not bitter cold. Uh, here you have actually more person hours of data. So our data go, back, go out to about 800 person hours. You can see, ignore the curves for the moment, you can see that the accumulation is doing better. In the previous one, the numbers were still going up with effort. But here you can see that these curves have mostly leveled off and between, see if I can get the numbers right, about 550 person hours and about 800 person hours, they've only added a few species. Okay? And so the same three curves get fit to these data. You can see the curves have very different behavior here in the middle of the, the calibration region. So again, we have data for this region. And right here in the middle, there's a fair amount of disagreement. So that right away tells us okay, these, these curves are fitting different things, and maybe this A curve is actually doing a pretty bad job because these points are way off the A curve where the data are available. Does that make sense to everybody? It's not a good fit. But maybe the B curve is doing a better job. See how it's, it's only a little ways off here. The A curve is a long way off. But the other thing to notice is that the spread amongst the three estimators, if we go to a lot more effort, the spread amongst the three estimators isn't as different. Look at that. Here, C was saying 560 and A is saying 850. Here, the difference is like 70 to 82. Okay, so as I said earlier, more data is always better and a more complete inventory is a more complete inventory. This inventory was getting up to that point where no species were added, so it's, it's going to be a better inventory. That's what we're trying to quantify. Okay? How done am I? Can I go home yet? Or can I go on and sample another area? Or can I say that I've pretty much finished my inventory and now I want to do some ecological studies? Right? Usually it's just, can I go home yet? So, I'm going to show you tables like this at several points in the day. And I want you to notice something. So this is, this is the table that we will be feeding into estimate S. Here we have a bunch of species. I've named them A through P, right? And I have a bunch of days. So these are the days that you're out there at Corrup National Park, and these are the species that you discover. On the first day, you saw four species. On the second, three. On the third, three. On the fourth, two. On the fifth, two on the 6th, 1, on the 7th, 1, on the 8th, 0, on the 9th, 0, on the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, and 14th, 0. So this is a nice accumulation curve. It's doing this. All right, those last several days, we don't find a single new species. But notice that these accumulation curves are only using the cumulative number of species that you have observed up to that point. So to make an accumulation curve out of this, it's easy. Again, you can do this in your field notebook. 
On the zeroth day, you have zero species. On the first day, you have four. On the second day, you have seven. On the third, you have 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. Okay, so all you're graphing is the number of days by the number of species total. But what I want you to notice is that on the 16th day, sorry, 14th day here, you were accumulating records of all of those other species. And so I want you to think about the fact that in this matrix, the only information you're using is the first record of each species. And all the other information that you collected or didn't is thrown out. It's ignored. So just to finish off the, the, the first session of the morning, I want you to think about this question. Look at that data matrix. Okay, the line is showing you the first record of each species. But this is something where, you know, this species A, I see it, I see it on every day except three. And let's see, what's the rarest species? Maybe this species, I only saw it on six days. Or this one, I only saw it on five days. But with species accumulation curves, all of that information is ignored. So in this inventory, notice that once I see a species, I tend to see it frequently after that. Look at this inventory. Okay, yeah, I get the same species accumulation curve, but notice that this species, species N, I only saw once. And species M, I saw twice. And species L, I saw three times. Here, I really am observing these species many times. Here, I'm lucky if I observe species. Okay, so raise your hand if you think that this inventory is more complete than this one. Okay, raise your hand if you think that this inventory is more complete than this one. I see one hand, two hands. Every, everybody gonna be that tentative? Same species accumulation curve. Because the species accumulation curve only looks at a tiny proportion of the data. Okay? That inventory says that I see species a lot. In fact, the rarest species in our inventory is species M, which we saw five times. In this matrix, I have species like N and P that I only saw once. Okay, I'm not gonna make you answer the question about which inventory is more complete. <coughs> Most species are known for multiple records in that one. Many species are known from very few records. All I'm saying is that the rest of the matrix includes a lot of information that you are ignoring when you're doing species accumulation curves. Anybody argue with me on that? Good. Okay, so now we're gonna get into a bit of mathematics that I'm not going to go into detail on. Um, this is a super important paper by a Chinese mathematician named An Chao. Um, Essentially, is, you know, estimating the population size for capture-recapture data with unequal catchability. Ah, all of a sudden that sounds a little bit more realistic. Maybe there are rare species and common species. Um, essentially, Chow set out to give us an estimator that instead of using just the first record, uses all the records, all the data 
that we may accumulate. Okay? So I would recommend this paper to you, but neither you nor I will be able to read it. Okay? I've, I've attempted to read it, and simply the mathematics is beyond me. Um, this, is the, this is the only part that isn't full of equations. But really, we're coming back to this, um, this point. We tend, when an inventory is done, we tend to see the species over and over again. And when an inventory is incomplete, we tend not to. So here are some of the estimators that Chow gives us. And by the way, you're going to do this in your field notebook every evening. OK, it's easy. Maybe not the variance estimators, but at least the the richness estimators. So what did Chow do? I can put this into words and it'll, it should feel pretty simple. Imagine you go out to Korup National Park and you spend 50 days. And you have all these species that you've detected and you have the full matrix so you know on how many days you have detected each of the species. The really common species you've detected on all 50 days, right? And the rarest species in your inventory you have detected on one day. Imagine if we had a, a frequency histogram of number of days that each species was detected. If every single species in your inventory was detected on all 50 days, are you done with your inventory? If every species was detected on every day, and you've been there 50 days, your accumulation curve looks like this. It's been flat for 50 days. Okay? But, so that, that's going to be like this world. But if some of your species have been detected very few times, then quantitatively you should be thinking that you are probably still missing some. And what Chow is doing is taking the number of species that have been detected on only one day, that's this Q1 in all of those equations, or F1. You can, you can pay most attention to the Chow 2. So, Q1 is the number of species detected on only one day. Q2 is the number of species detected on exactly two days. And in her derivation, she goes on and looks at Q3, the number of species detected on three days, Q4, Q5, Q6, okay? And what she found was that all of those um, Q values, those frequencies of detection, all of them tell you something about how many species are probably truly in your, in your fauna or flora. But the two that are most important are Q1 and Q2. So again, you've got some species that have been seen on 50 days, some that have been seen on 20 days, some that have been seen on five days, some that have been seen only on two days, some that have been seen on one day, and guess what? There are some species that you have seen on zero days. Okay? So, what is this equation? This is the number of species that you actually have observed. Okay? So, in those 50 days that you were out there at Corp sampling, th you saw this number of species. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 100. But then this is an estimator of how many species have been seen on zero days. Okay? And it's really simple. It's a sample size correction. Okay? So this is the number of days. If you've only been out zero days, then this term is, sorry, if you've only been out one day, 
then this is 1 minus 1, 0, over 1, 0. And so this term goes to 0. So if you've been out one day only, your best guess is your observed number, but your uncertainty is going to be extremely high. If you've been out a thousand days, then this is going to be a thousand minus one divided by a thousand. It's going to be almost one. And so this term will stay large. So all that is is a correction for small sample size. Okay? Now let's look at this piece of the estimator. It's the number of species that were seen only once squared divided by two times the number of species seen twice. Okay, and this is the result of a very complex derivation. In the paper, which I won't make you read, there is also Q3 and Q4 and Q5 and Q6, but she showed that their contribution to this term is minor. Most of the contribution comes from Q1 and Q2. Okay? So, all that we're saying is that our estimate of true species richness is equal to the number of species we've already observed plus this term. That not make sense to anybody? So here, what is Q1? Sorry, let's start out simpler. What is S observed here? What is S observed here? Nobody's speaking loud enough. Nine, thank you. And what is Q1 here? Zero, and what's Q1 here? Nine, okay? In fact, this example is so extreme that because Q2 is zero, that term actually goes to infinity. So it's kind of a trivial example. But I just want you to see that these are data that you can get with your eye quickly. Now there are more complicated estimators that you can't do in your field notebook. Um, they're quite a bit messier. This is the this uh, incidence coverage uh, covered uh, estimator. Um, but essentially, these are very similar to the Chow estimator. And if you use estimate S, which you all have at least tried to install on your computers, um, you can get these estimators. <coughs> It appears that the Chow estimator is probably more robust. We'll come back to that. So again, the good news here is that we have estimate S. So you probably could fix a tablet or a phone or something, or you could take your laptop out in the field if you wanted, and you could use estimate S out in the field. I prefer to leave my laptop in the city. Um, and use pretty simple indicators while I'm out in the field. Chow. Chow 2, to be specific. Anyhow, we have this, we have this program that implements Chow, implements ICES and ACES, implements the whole suite of estimators. And remember what I told you about temporal autocorrelation in the data? Estimate S does this nice series of resamplings and randomizations to break up those temporal autocorrelations. So these analyses will be better than what you can do in your field notebook, but they won't be hugely different. 